On a hot and sticky morning in August of 1976, 44-year-old Mabalo Lokela woke up drenched in sweat. It was his first morning back in his remote village of Yambuku in the country of Zaire, and he didn't feel right. Mabalo was the school headmaster in a poor community that lacked basic necessities like phones, running water, and electricity. He could almost never afford the luxury of a real vacation, but he had spent the past two weeks traveling Zaire's rainforests. He'd visited friends and family and spent some time hunting rainforest game like monkeys, antelope, and red river hogs. He'd had a great time, even though toward the end of the trip, he developed a persistent headache that developed into a fever. On the last morning, he woke up feeling shaky and nauseous, which made the long van ride back home absolutely awful. Mabalo had hoped that a good night's sleep in his own bed would help him feel better, but now, as he lay there staring up at the ceiling, he was feeling even worse. His stomach was churning and he felt a bit dizzy, too. He could tell this fever was not about to go away on its own. He needed medication. The only medical care that was available was a local clinic that was staffed by Belgian nuns and a few villagers. There were no doctors, and the clinic was really just set up to provide prenatal care for pregnant women. But usually, the nuns did have enough medication to tend to the village's basic medical needs. So Mabalo dragged himself out of bed, careful not to disturb his sleeping wife, he fished a clean shirt out of his travel bag, and then made the long walk from his home down the dirt road all the way to the clinic. 20 minutes later, Mabalo felt weary from walking in the morning sun, but he could see the distinctive red metal roofs of the complex that housed the clinic just ahead. He felt grateful that these nuns from so far away had come to live in their village, especially today. He really needed their help. Once Mavalo had crossed the clinic's courtyard and stepped through the door, he felt a bit better. It was still cool inside, since the sun had not been up long enough to warm the building up yet. He looked down the row of beds, all kept impeccably tidy, and then he looked along one wall, and he saw a nurse was putting a few pill bottles into a row of beat-up supply cabinets. Mabalo knew this nurse. He was a local man who was named Sakato, who worked for the nuns. Sakato waved and then asked Mabalo what brought him to the clinic that morning. Mabalo pointed at his head and said he'd been sick with a headache and fever for days. Sukato nodded sympathetically and asked Mabalo to have a seat in one of the little folding chairs by the door. One of the nuns would be over to talk to him shortly. As soon as Mabalo sat down, he closed his eyes and leaned his aching head back against the cool cement wall. He was lost in a daydream when he heard the click of footsteps on the clay tile floor and then a soothing voice spoke his name. He opened his eyes to greet a short Belgian nun in a white linen dress. The nun pulled down the cotton face mask she was wearing and introduced herself as Sister Adela. She beckoned him over to one of the beds and told him he was welcome to lie down while she took his vitals, and so Mabalo happily obliged. After a quick exam, the nun told Mabalo that he probably had malaria, a disease carried by mosquitoes that runs rampant in much of Africa. It's usually characterized by fever and flu-like symptoms, just like Mabalo had. And so, Sister Adela moved over to the worn cabinets along the wall and pulled out a syringe that was full of clear liquid. She explained that the liquid was a medication called quinine, which treated malaria. Sister Adela gently stuck the needle into Mabalo's left arm and then pushed the medicine inside of him, and then she set the syringe aside and put a bit of cotton over the drop of blood from the needle. She told Mabalo to go home and take a nap, and he'd be back to normal in a couple of days. Mabalo thanked her, then slowly stood up and made his way out of the clinic. Eight days later, Mabalo's wife, Mbuzu, spooned some broth into a bowl and set it beside the bed she shared with her husband. She tied her long braids with a strip of leather and slipped into her shoes by the door. Her shoes looked miniature next to Mabalo's shoes. He towered over her when they stood side by side. But now, as he was curled up in bed, she thought he looked so small. Mabalo was still sick despite having gone to the clinic. In fact, after visiting the clinic, he came back and developed diarrhea and was vomiting so much that Mbuzu thought that he must be dangerously dehydrated. Her husband was so weak he couldn't even get out of bed. Mbuzu knew she needed to get her husband more help. So she told Mabalo she'd be right back and she started walking to the clinic herself. When Mbuzu stepped into the clinic, she saw Sister Adela tending to a patient. 
Mbuzu waved her down and told her that her husband's symptoms had only gotten worse. She begged Sister Adela to please come home with her and see Mabalo. Sister Adela seemed alarmed that Mabalo was still sick, and so she agreed to go. Sister Adela told her mother superior that she'd be back in an hour. When the two women reached Mabalo's bedside, Mbuzu gasped. Her husband wasn't moving, and there was blood oozing from his eyes and ears. Mbuzu screamed and rushed to her husband. Mabalo opened his mouth like he was going to speak. Mbuzu leaned closer to hear whatever he was going to say, but then jumped back as a small river of blood gushed out of his mouth, trailing down his chin and staining their bedsheets. Horrified, Mbuzu turned to Sister Adela, who stared in disbelief. Then Mbuzu heard Mabalo begin to throw up, and so she grabbed a bucket just as he vomited up bile and blood. Mbuzu kept telling her husband that he'd be okay, he'd be okay, but Sister Adela quietly shook her head. Mbuzu could tell by the nun's shell-shocked expression that she clearly had no idea what to do. Sister Adela just said she'd give him another injection of quinine, even though the last shot had done no good at all. After giving him the quinine injection, Sister Adela stayed a bit longer, helping Mbuzu clean up the blood dripping from her husband's eyes and ears. Once he was all cleaned up, Sister Adela told the couple that she promised to check in the next morning. But as she left, Mbuzu began to worry that tomorrow might be too late. A few days later, on September 7, 1976, Mbuzu held her husband's hand as he took sharp, labored breaths. Sister Adela's quinine injections had not done anything. Mabalo was still unbelievably sick, his eyes had not stopped bleeding, and his saliva was red with blood. Mbuzu could hear blood gurgle in her husband's throat as he struggled to get air. She squeezed his hand helplessly until she heard her husband stop breathing. Suddenly, Mbuzu felt a terrible emptiness. Her husband was dead. She wrapped their bedsheet around Mabalo, letting her tears fall onto his motionless body. A few hours later, Mbuzu stooped over Mabalo's body alongside the women of Mabalo's family and some of Mbuzu's closest friends. Their front yard was full of neighbors and loved ones who came to sit with Mabuzu as she grieved. Despite her grief, Mabuzu felt touched by how many people mobilized to support her. Mabuzu and the other women washed Mabalo's body and wrapped him in a clean burial shroud. This was the funeral tradition in their village. Tomorrow, the men in the village would move Mabalo to the graveyard to be buried. A few days later, on the morning after Mabalo's funeral, Mbuzu awoke feeling totally exhausted. She'd barely eaten since her husband died, and she was completely worn out from crying. The moment she sat up, her head began to throb. She rubbed her temples trying to ease the pain, and then without warning, she felt vomit surge in her throat. She barely had time to run outside before she threw up. Mbuzu knew this had to be more than just exhaustion. She cleaned herself up and then headed for the clinic right away. Mabalo's nurse friend, Sukato, had just finished sweeping the floor when Mbuzu appeared at the doorstep that morning. She looked awful. Even though the morning was still fairly cool, Sukato could see that Mbuzu was sweating profusely. Sukato felt a shiver run up his spine as he remembered the day that Mabalo had stumbled through the clinic doorway. He'd looked just as sick as Mbuzu looked now. He told Mbuzu to sit down, and then he ran out back to grab the nuns. Sukato came back inside with Sister Adela, and together they led Mbuzu to a bed. Sukato gave Mbuzu an encouraging smile, even though he feared she'd caught the same disease as Mabalo, which obviously killed Mabalo. And when his eyes met Mbuzu's, he could tell she was fearing the same thing. A few days later, in mid-September, Sakato was at work, busy refilling syringes with quinine, the malaria medicine. Behind him, Mbuzu's mother, sister, and daughter were all lying in clinic beds alongside Mbuzu. All of them were suffering from the same high fever and persistent headache. Mbuzu's mother had started hallucinating, especially at night. Sometimes, when she was sleepy and her fever was spiking, she'd say that her dead son-in-law was standing in the clinic. Other times, she would see shadows that were not there. Sukato felt certain that these women did not have malaria. For one thing, malaria is not contagious, so it made no sense that four women from the same family had gotten sick one after another. 
Then there was the way that Sister Adela had described Mabalo bleeding from his eyes, ears, and mouth before dying. Sakato had never seen malaria cause something like that. To Sakato, it seemed like this bleeding sickness was something new and that it was somehow spreading among families. Mbuzu and her relatives had not started bleeding yet, but if their illness progressed anything like Mabalo's had, it wouldn't be long until they did. The thought of an entire room full of patients all bleeding from their eyes horrified Sakato. And if their disease really was contagious, then he could be lying in bed among them by tomorrow bleeding out of his eyes. But then he looked across the room to a perfectly healthy pregnant woman who was resting in bed with an IV in her arm. She had come in for a routine checkup and prenatal vitamins. For this woman and everyone else in Yambuku, the little clinic was the only healthcare they had. It was literally the difference between life and death for countless villagers. Sakato knew that whatever the risk, he had to keep coming back to work. People were counting on him. Full of renewed purpose, Sakato finished filling the syringes of quinine and went to help his patients. A week later, just before sunrise, Sakato stood outside the clinic door with a growing sense of dread. More and more villagers were getting sick, all with the same horrible symptoms. 21 people had come to the clinic with this disease so far, and every single one of them had lingered in bed, unable to eat or drink, growing so weak that they could barely lift their heads, until finally, around the 10-day mark after getting sick, blood would start leaking from their ears and eyes. Some patients had red-stained teeth from all the blood pooling in their mouths. After that, it was only a matter of days before they died from blood loss. Almost all of the people who'd gotten sick had died. Mbuzu had lived, but she lost her entire family. At this point, only four patients remained alive in the clinic. And the outbreak was far from over. Two days ago, one of the pregnant women who came for prenatal vitamins began bleeding. Sakato had tended to her himself, knowing that if the mother died, her baby would too. The stress was really weighing on him. Even from the clinic doorstep, he could already smell the sweat and sickness of the patients inside. But as scared as Sakato was about getting sick himself, he was not going to stop helping. He pulled his protective mask from his pocket and wrapped it around his face. Then he unlocked the front door and stepped inside. As quietly as possible, Sakato moved down the row of beds, and by the far wall, the pregnant woman was lying on her side beneath the blanket. Sakato held his breath as he approached her, hoping she was still alive. But as he rounded her bed and crouched down, he could tell that she was not breathing. Sakato wanted to get a wet rag to clean her up a bit, but he knew that duty belonged to her family. So he just pulled the bedsheet up over her head and said a little prayer for everyone who remained in Yambuku. One morning a few days later, so in late September, Sakato sat by Sister Adela's bedside. The brave nun who had treated so many patients with the bleeding sickness now had the disease herself. And sadly, she was far from alone. 17 nuns lived at the mission, and 11 of them had fallen ill with this sickness. Sakato and Sister Adela had cared for them together, in addition to the patient still lying in the clinic across the courtyard. One by one, each of the 11 nuns had died except for Adela, who was barely clinging to life. The mother superior had been forced to close the clinic altogether, leaving this ravaged village with no one left to care for the sick and dying. Sakato's sick neighbors had started leaving Yambuku, searching for help in nearby villages. Nobody had returned alive. But it was no better in Yambuku. Sakato did the math and realized that so far, 90% of the people treated at their clinic for this bleeding sickness had died. Sakato pressed an aspirin into Sister Adela's shaky hand and then handed her a cup of water. The clinic had treated so many patients over the last month that they were down to their last aspirin, and this was it. Sister Adela thanked him with a hoarse voice, and he told her to please get some rest. Sakato left her room and walked down the long cement hallway that ran through the nun's living quarters. For years, this had always been a very busy and bustling corridor, but now it was a ghost town. Sakato walked past empty room after empty room where the nuns used to live before the bleeding sickness had killed them. As Sakato neared the kitchen, he heard the crackle of static filtering in from the supply closet where the nuns kept their two-way radio. 
He peeked inside and found the Mother Superior turning dials as she tried to reach the outside world. She looked up at Sakado, and he was taken aback by the weariness in her face. She told him that all morning she'd been calling for help. She'd sent out radio signal after radio signal, hoping someone might hear and get word to the Red Cross or the Zairean government that they desperately needed help. But so far, nobody had responded. Sakato felt a wave of dread wash over him as he listened to the Mother Superior's grim news. Over the past six weeks, they'd received no news from the outside world and no additional medical supplies. And now Sakato wondered how far the disease had really spread. Had it gone all the way across Africa? Was it all over the world? Was there anybody still left out there? Sakato needed fresh air. He stumbled out of the kitchen into the backyard behind the mission complex. Nearer to the tree line, there was a row of 11 white crosses marking the dead nun's graves. Sakato had helped dig those graves. He imagined Sister Adela lying there on the edge of the jungle beneath her white cross. And now he wondered who would dig his grave when he eventually caught the sickness and died too. And then, almost like clockwork, a wave of nausea overtook him. Sakato hunched over and vomited on the ground. And when he looked down, his vomit was full of bile and blood. He had finally caught the bleeding sickness. About a week later, on the last day of September, Sakato was laying in bed staring at the ceiling. Because the clinic was shut down, he had just quarantined himself at home. Sakato had not left his bed for days, and he felt incredibly weak, but so far, he had not begun bleeding from the eyes or ears. He was determined to stay alive through sheer willpower. Just then, the ground beneath him began to shake, making the glass on his bedside table rattle. Sakato hoisted himself up onto his forearms to look out the window. He could see military vehicles making their way down the long dirt road that led into Yambuku. As Sakato watched in astonishment, the vehicles fanned out and surrounded his corner of the village. The soldier then spoke into the bullhorn and announced that Yambuku was now under quarantine. Nobody was leaving or coming back. Sakato was too weak, so he laid back down on his bed and just listened to the sound of the booming voice that was filling the air. The soldier continued and said that people in 50 surrounding villages were now also experiencing the bleeding sickness. Even people in the capital city of Kinshasa, 700 miles away, were showing symptoms. But the soldier said that the whole outbreak began right here in Yambuku. Sakato closed his eyes as the horror of their situation sank in. The disease was clearly spreading fast, and it was also clear that the government had no idea how to stop it. The people of Zaire needed help from the outside, but he couldn't imagine anyone would be brave enough to come to Zaire to fight this lethal sickness. A week later, a 27-year-old Belgian scientist named Peter Pio felt a rush of anticipation as he stepped off a plane onto an airstrip located 75 miles from Yambuku. It was a little more than a month after the first victim of the bleeding disease, Mabalo Lokela, had died. Peter was part of an international team of scientists and doctors sent to try to stop the disease before it spread beyond Zaire. Peter looked around the airstrip, taking in the lush green rainforest that hummed with plant and animal life. To him, it was the most beautiful landscape he'd ever seen. It was totally unlike anything in his native Belgium. Peter turned to help his teammates, who were all collecting their luggage from the belly of their little plane. Peter had to admit that he was not nearly as qualified for this assignment to go stop this disease as his teammates were. Peter had only recently graduated from medical school. However, he'd crammed in as much research as possible before he left Belgium, he learned about using protective equipment, taking samples in the field, and how to take and test blood samples. A few days earlier, the American Centers for Disease Control, or CDC for short, had confirmed that the bleeding disease plaguing Zaire was caused by a virus no one had ever seen before. Nobody knew where this virus came from or how to treat it, but they did know where they needed to start the investigation. Nearly one quarter of the 300 or so cases across the entire country were reported in Yambuku. So Peter and his more experienced teammates knew that their journey would start right there. 
Peter was last to collect his bags from inside the plane. He told the pilot they were good to go, and the pilot shouted adieu as the plane took off. It occurred to Peter right away that in this part of Africa, people didn't really say adieu. They would say au revoir to say goodbye, which was French for see you again. But the pilot had just said adieu, which simply meant goodbye, as though he did not expect to see Peter or his colleagues ever again. Peter swallowed hard. There was no going back now. So he hoisted his bag up onto his shoulder and then followed the rest of his team off the airstrip toward a line of waiting Land Rovers. Four hours later, from the back seat of a Land Rover, Peter saw a group of small wooden houses with thatched roofs in the distance. He knew that it had to be Yambuku. As they reached the center of the village, the Land Rover stopped. It took a moment for Peter to see why the drivers had pulled over. The road into the clinic compound was blocked. Hospital gauze was draped across the entrance to warn people to stay away. On a tree nearby, a sign had been nailed up. It read, quote, Please stop. Anyone who crosses here may die. End quote. Peter could feel the mood in the Land Rover shift, as though the gravity of this situation was now truly sinking in. But nobody said a word, so Peter decided to take charge. He jumped out of the Land Rover, stepped over the gauze barricade, and began walking toward the clinic. As he approached, three nuns came rushing out, yelling at him to stop. But Peter kind of held up a hand, and he told the first nun that came up to him that they were doctors, and they were here to help figure out what was causing the bleeding sickness. Peter was touched by the look of utter relief on the nun's face. She said her name was Sister Marcella. She told Peter that for the past two weeks, the clinic had just been closed, and the remaining living nuns were simply praying for an end to this horror. She said that she and the others would do whatever she could to assist them, and motioned for Peter and the others to follow her inside the clinic. Peter carried his bag through the empty clinic and out into the courtyard. As the rest of the team got busy setting up a work camp, Peter asked Sister Marcella if they had any records of the patients who'd gotten sick from this disease and died. She nodded and promised to give him all her notes on the 70 victims from Yambuku, 63 of whom were now dead. Peter could hardly contain his shock. He'd known the disease was bad, but hearing the death toll out loud was staggering. Two hours later, as the nuns cooked dinner, Peter and his team huddled around a table in the courtyard. Peter listened as the lead doctor explained their mission. The next morning, they would head out into the countryside looking for victims. They needed to talk to sick people and their families about when and where they got the disease and then collect their blood for analysis. Peter was hoping that after a few days of interviews and testing samples, they could get an idea of how this disease was spreading. He felt energized again as he got up from the table and helped the nuns carry dinner out to his team. The next morning, Peter and three teammates drove west along a red dirt road on their way to visit nearby villages. Peter was struck again by how lush and green everything was. He loved listening to the sounds of insects and birds humming in the growing heat. It was easy to forget why he was there. But a reminder came soon enough when their Land Rover encountered a big pile of logs blocking the road about an hour west of Yambuku. The nuns had actually warned them about this. Most of these surrounding villages had blocked off their roads to keep out the people who had this bleeding sickness. The villagers had no supplies left to give out, and they obviously did not want to catch the sickness themselves. Peter wanted to respect their wishes, but it was vital for them to see what was going on in these other villages. So Peter and the rest of his team dragged the logs to the side of the road, then jumped back into the car and continued their journey. As the Land Rover made its way into the center of this village, people came out to see what was going on. Peter had expected the villagers to avoid them out of fear, so he was surprised when a few of the villagers gathered right around their car, looking very curious. The driver parked the car and everybody piled out while the team leader went to speak with the village elders. Peter took a little piece of candy out of his pocket and handed it to one of the little boys who'd come to investigate. He noticed that none of the kids playing around the village seemed sick. He wondered if maybe the roadblock had worked. Perhaps it stopped the disease from reaching this village. Maybe there would be no blood samples to collect here or survivors to talk to. That would be good news for the village, but a waste of a trip for Peter and his team. But then the team leader waved Peter over. He said one of the villagers had something to show them. So Peter grabbed his backpack from the Land Rover, and they followed this villager toward a nearby mud-and-clay home with a banana leaf roof. 
At the doorway, they all put on protective equipment, which included motorcycle goggles, gloves, paper face masks, and long sanitary gowns. Then they followed the villager into the modest home. It was cooler inside, but Peter's protective equipment still felt sweltering in the midday heat. Toward the back, Peter saw a husband and wife laying on a raffia mat on the floor. As Peter neared them, he could see they were so weak they could barely move. Dried blood coated their ears and their cheeks from where it had streamed out of their eyes. To Peter, it was like something out of a zombie film, and for a moment, he just froze. But then he remembered where he was and what he had to do. Peter took a syringe out of his backpack and knelt down next to the woman. He gently stuck the needle into her arm and filled a vial with her blood. The team leader knelt down on the other side of the raffia mat to take a sample from the man. Peter stood up and walked over to his backpack and pulled a little pouch from inside. He wrapped the vials of blood in plastic and stuck them into a baggie before putting the bag and the syringe into his backpack. And right as he did that, Peter turned around because his team leader gasped. It took Peter a moment to realize what had happened. The sick man on the floor had just died. Peter just stood there for a moment, totally frozen in surprise. Then he looked over at the dead man's wife, who looked like she didn't have long to live either. To Peter, it felt callous to leave her, and yet there was nothing they could do. They had no idea how to treat this new disease. In fact, the only way they could help was just to keep on moving. The villager who had led them into this hut ushered Peter and his team leader out of the home. As he walked them back to their car, the villager explained that soon that entire home would be full of women washing the man's body and preparing it for burial. It would be disrespectful for Peter and his teammate to be there anyway. So Peter, feeling relieved, thanked the man as he hopped into the Land Rover and then they drove off to the next village. On the evening of the third day, Peter and his crew sat around their table in the clinic courtyard and compared notes. One thing they'd been noticing was that in many villages, more women seemed to get sick than men. And in Yambuku, a lot of pregnant women seemed to contract the sickness. But that wasn't enough information to actually draw any conclusions just yet. Strangely, the researchers had found that the village with the fewest bleeding sickness cases actually had no medical care at all. The village had only a traditional healer who handed out herbs and did healing rituals, but had almost no knowledge of modern medicine. And yet, his village was the only one they visited where nobody had died. The next day, Peter and his team leader went to that village where nobody had died yet to investigate further. When they arrived, the villagers brought them to their healer. As the team leader interviewed the healer, it occurred to Peter that the healer's home smelled strongly of bleach. He only noticed it because since landing in Zaire, he'd mostly smelled firewood, generator oil, and the jungle. So this chemical smell really stood out. Peter asked the healer why he was using so much bleach, and the healer just raised an eyebrow, as though Peter had just asked him a totally ridiculous question. The healer pointed at a bunch of gadgets lying on top of a small table. Most were made of metal, and they looked like medical equipment, while others appeared to be homemade. The healer told Peter that those were his instruments and he would use bleach and chlorine to sanitize them between clients. Once he said it, Peter almost felt dumb because the answer was so obvious. In the West, doctors used disinfectants to sterilize medical instruments, but in a place like this that was more remote, bleach was a decent substitute. Peter made a note of this in his journal. That evening, when they arrived back at the clinic in Yambuku, Peter followed Sister Marcella through the clinic, watching as she tidied up the space. He knew that she had seen this disease much more than they had, and so maybe she knew something that he and his team had not thought to ask about. Peter told her about the village with the local healer, where nobody had died from the bleeding sickness. Sister Marcella said she actually was not surprised at all. She said the number of cases in Yambuku did not really start to rise quickly until the first patient, the school headmaster, had died. Peter stopped walking. The comment kind of struck him as odd. He asked Sister Marcella to explain what she meant. She turned and told Peter that, so far, the cases they'd seen had come in bursts. Every time there was a funeral, like clockwork, the next several cases of the bleeding sickness they would see would be people who had attended that funeral. It was like one big chain reaction. Peter thanked Marcella for the tour, and as he headed outside, his mind was racing. 
He and his teammates knew that this disease spread most easily to people closest to the sick, but they had not given much thought to the funerals themselves. Could it be that funerals were a breeding ground for this sickness? Marcella had said that it was usually close friends and family of the dead who got sick next, not all the other kind of random mourners who came to the funerals. So it wasn't just that funerals brought large groups of people close together. There had to be something about Zairean funerals that encouraged the spread amongst close family. Peter went to share this information with his team, determined to figure out what the cause might be. A few hours later, Peter sat around the courtyard table with his team, studying all the information they had collected from villages throughout the region. In every village they'd visited, the bleeding sickness had appeared in bursts, mostly affecting close friends and family of the deceased. And they noticed far more women were contracting the disease than men. Then there was another piece of information. In Yambuku, many pregnant women who visited the clinic later got sick. These pregnant women were just about the only ones to get the disease who had not recently been at a funeral for a close family member. Now, Peter and his team knew two things for certain. Something about these funerals was making people sick. And there was something unique about Yambuku that was giving the disease to pregnant women. Peter and his teammates talked into the night, but they just couldn't figure out what the connection was. It was like the explanation was staring them right in the face, but they just could not connect the dots. Peter rubbed his eyes, fighting off sleep. He did not want to give up and go to bed yet. So he stood and offered to make some coffee, and everyone agreed. Nobody was ready to call it a night. A few minutes later, Peter rummaged through the small kitchen in the nun's living quarters, looking for the coffee. Then he heard footsteps behind him and turned to see the clinic's nurse, Sakato, carrying a tray of food. Peter had met Sakato several times and really liked him. Peter also knew that Sakato was one of the very lucky 10% of people to survive the bleeding sickness. So, to Peter, Sakato was like a walking miracle. Sakato also seemed to know just about everything, and he was always so eager to help. Peter asked Sakato if he wouldn't mind helping him find the coffee. Sakato smiled knowingly, and then reached into one of the tall cabinets and pulled out a glass jar. That's when Peter had a thought. He asked Sakato to walk him through the procedure for when pregnant women came to the clinic for prenatal care. Sakato could do it in his sleep. He'd seen the nurses do it a thousand times. He motioned for Peter to follow him into the clinic. There, Peter watched as Sakato walked to the counter in the back of the clinic and opened up one of the drawers. He withdrew five syringes and then told Peter that these were the five needles that they used to treat their patients vitamin shots for expecting mothers, and quinine shots for malaria patients. Sakato said they cleaned these needles every evening to keep them in good working order. As Sakato put the needles back in their drawer, Peter realized what Sakato had just said, that they were only cleaning the needles once a day. He blinked, trying not to seem too alarmed. He clarified with Sakato that the clinic used the same needles between pregnant women and bleeding sickness patients, and Sakato said yes, especially in the beginning when the nuns thought everybody just had malaria. Peter was dumbfounded. That meant healthy pregnant women who had come to the clinic to get a vitamin shot were likely being injected with tiny droplets of blood from people who had the bleeding sickness. No wonder so many pregnant women and their babies were dying in Yambuku. They were being directly injected with the disease by their nurses. The thought of it made Peter sick. Peter remembered the healer whose home smelled like bleach. He had been actually sterilizing his instruments between patients, and so that was why the bleeding sickness had not spread in his village. Now the wheels in Peter's brain were really turning. He thought back to the man who died right as they took his blood sample during the first week in Zaire. The villager who'd taken them there had said the women in the dead man's family had to wash his body for burial right away. And right then, Peter's eyes went wide as he had this sudden realization. He thanked Sakato and hurried right back out to the courtyard where his teammates were working because he had a vital piece of information he needed to share with them. Peter and his team soon realized that the bleeding sickness was spread through contact with bodily fluids. In Zaire, part of the funeral custom was for the women in the family to wash the body of the deceased immediately after death. 
the virus was still very much alive on the dead body and spread when loved ones came into contact with bodily fluids such as blood. Meanwhile, the pregnant women in Yambuku were getting this disease from contaminated blood on the syringes used for their vitamin shots. As Peter and his team researched the disease further, they soon discovered that this lethal virus was originally confined to animals like chimpanzees and fruit bats. Mabalo Lokela, the school headmaster in Yambuku, and Patient Zero likely ate infected game on his hunting trip and became the first human victim. His wife Mbuzu and her family then caught the virus while preparing his body for burial. By the time Peter and his team learned how the bleeding sickness spread, nearly 300 people across Zaire and neighboring southern Sudan had died. But the spread was stopped thanks to the villagers' self-imposed quarantine and medical information being shared widely about the danger of sharing needles and touching bodily fluids. Peter and his teammates were tapped with naming this disease, and they decided to call it the Ebola virus after a river in the area. They thought about naming it Yambuku, but they didn't want to stigmatize the village. Since 1976, there have been more than 38 outbreaks of Ebola and over 15,000 deaths. Now, there is a vaccine for a particular strain of the Ebola virus, but as of today, there is still no cure. In the early 1980s, John Harder was the classic, athletic, popular kid at his high school in Delaware, Ohio, which is a relatively small town just outside of the state's capital. But unlike most stereotypes that paint high school jocks as being these total jerks that bully people and they're kind of stupid, John was none of those things. He was incredibly friendly and very warm-hearted and seemed to get along with everyone. John also was known for having a great sense of humor. In particular, he liked to play these kind of harmless pranks that would make people smile, like the time he very enthusiastically joined the cheerleaders during a high school pep rally, despite not actually being a cheerleader himself. John was set to graduate from high school on June 5th, 1983, and his plan was to study accounting at Kent State University the following year. A few weeks before his graduation, John's high school began selling these tickets to a grad night at a huge amusement park called Kings Island. Kings Island was located about two hours west of John's high school, and it was home to dozens of roller coasters, water slides, and many other attractions. During their so-called grad nights, this amusement park would shut down their public operations and not let anybody into the park that did not have these special student tickets that they gave to local area high schools. John, who was 17 years old at the time, was very excited at the idea of going to this grad night, and so he went and purchased tickets along with about 20 other students from his high school. At about 3.30 p.m. on Friday, May 13th, John and the other students who had bought grad night tickets met up outside of their high school. While this was a school-sponsored trip, the students were responsible for driving themselves to the park. And so after all the students were accounted for, they all piled into a couple of their cars and they began their journey to the park. After a few stops along the way to get food and go to the bathroom, the students finally arrived at the park at about 7 p.m. And on the drive, John, who had been a passenger, had drank half a bottle of rum and about three to six beers. And so when he got out, he could barely stand, he was so drunk. And so the students made their way over to the front gate, they showed the attendant their grad night ticket, and they were allowed inside. And surprisingly, despite it being this special night where only people with these tickets were allowed in, it was still pretty crowded. There were lots of students that apparently wanted to come to this event. Once John and the rest of the students from the Delaware High School had come inside the park, there was no rule that they had to stick together for the duration of their time there, and so they all kind of broke into their separate groups and went their separate ways. In John's particular group was his girlfriend, Pam, and for the first hour they were in the park together, all they did was bicker and fight. Onlookers would say John looked visibly upset and very emotional and very drunk. By 8.30 p.m., when John's group had gotten in line for this roller coaster, John was now openly saying, I don't want to be here anymore, I just want to go home. And it was pretty obvious he was still just mad at Pam, and that's why he was saying all this, was just trying to make Pam feel bad. And so some of the group members told John just, hey man, calm down, you're overreacting, just try to enjoy this ride, and then afterwards we'll get some food, it'll be fine. But it was pretty clear that John was really worked up and seemed incapable of having a good time at this point. But regardless, John and the rest of the group, they got on this ride at about 9 p.m. And then after the ride was over, they disembarked and they walked away from the ride to regroup and figure out what was next. And they're looking around and John is nowhere to be found. 
And so after waiting for a few minutes and actually walking around looking for him, they decided that, you know what? He was really upset before he got on this ride. He probably just wanted to walk away and be by himself for a bit. I'm sure we'll see him later in the night. So John's group, without John, just continued going around the park, going on different rides. And for the next few hours, they kind of forgot about John. It wasn't until the end of the night, when over the loudspeaker, the park officials said, okay, we're closing the park now, that they started walking out and wondering where John was. And they were convinced, you know what, I'm sure he's back at the cars. He's probably waiting for us because he just wants to go home. So they leave the park, they get out to their cars in the lot, and John's not there. And so at this point, the group's starting to get a little bit concerned because no one knows where he is. They're meeting up with the other groups from their high school. No one's seen John. And so they're all just kind of staring at the front gate, waiting for John to come out, but he doesn't. And then eventually the lights in the park start shutting down and the security guard comes out front and locks the front gate. And that's when the group knew they had a problem. After an extensive investigation by police, this is their best guess as to what happened to John. After John and his small group rode that roller coaster around 9 p.m., John very quickly disembarked the ride before anybody else in his group could see him, and then John stumbled his way towards the replica Eiffel Tower that this park was famous for. This tower stood at about 300 feet tall and was built to be an exact replica of the Eiffel Tower in Paris, France, but this one at Kings Island was only a third the size. It had three elevators that went up the center of the structure, and the elevators would stop at a 50-foot platform and a 275-foot platform where guests could look out and have a great view of the park. While today, the only way to access these two viewing platforms is through these elevators, at the time John was at the park in 1983, the park actually had a flight of stairs that went from the ground all the way to the very top of the tower that went right up the middle of the structure, and the public was allowed to take these stairs all the way up to the first platform, that 50-foot platform. And while the stairs did actually continue beyond that up to the 275 foot platform, the public was not allowed to go any higher on the stairs than that first platform. And so if you took these stairs, once you got to the 50 foot platform, there would be a big fence right on the stairwell preventing you from going any farther. And it says authorized personnel only, don't go any farther. And so the only people that would walk up those additional flights of stairs were staff that had a special key. When John stumbled his way over to the base of this replica tower, he did not get on an elevator. Instead, he took the stairs. So he made his way up to the 50-foot platform, and then when he got to the six-foot-tall gate preventing him from going any farther, he just climbed up and over it and continued walking up the stairs, and nobody stopped him. He finally came to a stop just below the 275-foot mark. And so he's on the stairwell. And at this point, he turns and faces the inside of the tower. It's all these metal beams all over the place. And he climbs over the railing of the stairs he's on. And he climbs onto this narrow beam that's actually a part of the support structure of this tower. And he grabs onto the beam above him and just begins walking along this beam towards the center of the tower where the three elevator shafts are. Now, there's no safety net on either side of John. So if he slips and falls, he's falling hundreds of feet to the ground. And if he keeps walking and actually gets into the elevator shaft, there's nothing protecting him from being struck by one of the elevators because the people who built this tower were not thinking about people walking on these exposed beams hundreds of feet up into the air. This is a totally dangerous and unauthorized area. But John just continues shimmying across this beam until he does get to the middle of the tower. And now he's literally standing, looking down into the elevator shafts. And as he's most likely looking around, admiring where he was, one of the elevator cars below him began to start moving. To understand what happens next, you need to have a rudimentary understanding of how this elevator worked. A large metal rope was attached to the top of the elevator car, and from there it was thread up the elevator shaft all the way to the top, where it was fed through a pulley that was anchored to the ceiling, and then that rope was fed right back down the shaft to the bottom, where it was attached to a counterweight. A counterweight is just a large heavy weight that's designed to balance this elevator car on this pulley system. Without the weight, the elevator car would just slip off of that pulley. And so any time the elevator car moved up, the counterweight would move down and vice versa, making sure that car was always balanced. And so John is standing right on the edge of this elevator shaft, presumably just kind of looking around, admiring where he was, when down below him, that elevator car starts to move and it starts to actually descend away from John. And so the car itself is not necessarily a threat to John. However, its counterweight is because if the car is going down, its counterweight is going up. 
and it's right in the path of John. And so as John is leaning out over the shaft looking around, this counterweight comes screaming up and picks him off of the beam he's on and carries him up into the shaft. The impact on John was so strong that it's believed he was actually impaled on some of the exposed metal wiring on top of this counterweight, and he got totally tangled up in all of the cables on top of there. And so as John is desperately trying to free himself, the elevator operator, there was always a staff member inside of these elevator cars, he actually noticed when John got stuck on the counterweight. But of course, this worker would have no idea that's what it was. They would later recall, it just felt like the car suddenly jumped. And so this worker, fearing that something had gone wrong with the elevator car itself, he decided he would ride it all the way to the bottom, let everybody get out, and then ride back up to the top, totally empty, to make sure that the car actually worked before allowing people back on. And so the worker went to the ground, everybody got out, he closed the doors, he began his ascent, he got to that first platform at 50 feet, no issues, he got about 10 feet above that first platform, so at about 60 feet, when all of a sudden he hears an unbelievably loud thud on the roof of his elevator car, causing his car to immediately come to a stop. And then blood began pouring over the sides of the car over the windows. After getting stuck on the counterweight, John probably did everything he could to try to free himself, but he just couldn't do it. However, when that elevator worker decided to go back up again to test the capacity of the elevator car, it reversed the direction of the counterweight that John was stuck on. And so as that car was going up, John began going down, and it was on this descent that parts of John's body must have been dangling off of this counterweight, and they must have struck one of the beams as he was going down, and that beam effectively pried him off of whatever he was stuck on and threw him over the edge into the center of the shaft. And so John would fall 200 feet and he would land on top of that elevator car, dying instantly. The park was very quick to block off the ride and the whole scene and got police involved very quickly. So only a very small number of guests and employees were aware an accident had even happened. And very few of them were aware that it had been a fatal accident. As for the police, they knew they had a dead body, but they had no way to identify the body. There was no ID cards on John, and so they had no way to let his friends know that were in the park or to tell his family. And so it wasn't until that night when John's friends are out in the parking lot waiting for John to come out again that they got really worried and they went up and spoke to a security guard at the front of the park. And that security guard, after hearing their story, would tell them that actually there had been an accident in the park and there was a body and the police are still trying to identify this body. And so maybe you guys want to go over to the hospital and see if it's your friend. So sure enough, the friends went to the hospital and they would confirm that the body was John Harder. To this day, no one knows for sure why John did what he did. Some say he was just drunk and it was a dumb decision that led to his death. Others say he was suicidal, but many of the people that were close to him say, no way, he was not suicidal. And other people say, you know, John, he loved attention, and so perhaps this was a dangerous stunt gone too far. But regardless of his reasons, John had clearly intentionally entered an area that was off limits and it got him killed. Our next story is called Under the Pier. In the 1960s, Alan Burkhart opened a riverfront restaurant in Beaumont, Texas. And for the next 50 plus years, his customers would eat burgers, drink beers, and on super hot days, they would jump off the pier into the river to cool down. But one day in June of 2015, while Alan was in his restaurant looking out the back window, he saw something strange in the river. When he went outside to get a better look, he noticed his customers who were eating outside had also noticed this strange thing, and now they were standing up and nervously watching it as it floated by. Alan immediately yelled out to everyone to not go swimming, obviously, based on what they were seeing, and then he went back inside and made a sign that said no swimming, and he posted it on the pier. A few weeks later, on July 2nd, a 28-year-old local man named Tommy Woodward and his girlfriend, Victoria LeBlanc, arrived at Allen's restaurant for a fun night out. After several hours of drinking and playing pool, Tommy and his girlfriend made their way over to the bar and had a seat, at which point Tommy began telling his girlfriend that he planned on going swimming in the river that night. The bartender overheard him and said, Tommy, you can't go swimming in the river anymore. But Tommy was a bit of a rule breaker and said he didn't care, he was going to go anyways. The bartender began pleading with him and even got other staff members of the restaurant to talk sense into Tommy that he should not get in the water. 
But eventually Tommy just stood up, he grabbed his girlfriend's hand, left the restaurant and began walking down towards the pier. The bartender at this point just kind of rolled her eyes and thought, I can't do anything to stop him. And so she went back to her bartending duties. When Tommy and Victoria got down to the pier, the black water was quiet and calm as Tommy took off his shirt and removed his valuables from his pockets. Right before Tommy was about to jump into the water, Victoria stopped him and said she thought she saw something moving underneath the pier. But Tommy just laughed and said he didn't care and jumped into the water and disappeared below the surface. Immediately, the water around Tommy seemed to erupt like a bomb had gone off underneath him. When Tommy came back up to the surface, he was screaming and trying to swim back to the pier, but before he could get there, something pulled him under the water. And then a few seconds later, Tommy came back up again, and this time Victoria could see the left side of his torso was bleeding profusely. And so she instinctively leapt into the water to try to save him. And Tommy, even though he knew he needed help, he said to her, get back on land, save yourself. And so she obliged. She climbed back onto the pier, and when she turned around, she caught a final glimpse of Tommy as he was pulled back under the water, and this time he did not come back up again. The bartender had heard screaming and so ran down with a flashlight to the pier, and when she got there, Victoria was hysterical and she was yelling Tommy's name and looking out over the water. And so the bartender at this point is reasonably certain she knows what happened to Tommy, but if by some miracle he's still alive, she wants to find him. And so she raises her flashlight and she begins scanning the now totally calm black water. And as she's scanning, she finds him. He's floating face down, way off in the middle of the river. And as soon as the flashlight hits him, something pulls his body under the water and he disappears from view. It was no secret that the river that ran next to Alan's restaurant was home to alligators. But these alligators were small and they didn't bother anybody. And so the locals really didn't have any issues swimming with them. In fact, they had nicknamed two of the alligators that were seen the most often. They named them Cheeto and Marshmallow. But on that day in June of 2015, when Alan and the other guests saw this thing out in the river, what they were seeing was a monster alligator, the likes of which they had never seen before in this river. It was at least 11 feet long and over 400 pounds. And that summer, it decided to make the underside of Alan's pier its home. And so that night when Tommy leapt into the water, it was this monster alligator's feeding time, and so Tommy became its dinner. About two hours after Tommy was attacked, what was left of him was recovered from the river. Tommy became the first alligator-related fatality in Texas in nearly 200 years. The next and final story of today's episode is called Hide and Seek. On or around June 10th, 2021, Jennifer Buell and her two sons, 12-year-old Charlie and 7-year-old Johnny, touched down at Cancun International Airport in Cancun, Mexico. The family, who lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, was there for a nice long vacation during the kids' summer break, which had started just a few weeks earlier. After getting off the plane and getting their luggage, the Buell family made their way out of the airport and they hopped on a shuttle that brought them to their resort. They were staying at Club Med Cancun, which is a very popular all-inclusive family resort that's located right at the tip of the Riviera Maya. And the Riviera Maya is just stunningly beautiful. It's this stretch on the western side of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico that's basically all white sand beaches and beautiful clear turquoise water. But Club Med Cancun's fabulous location was not the only reason why families loved going there so much. Club Med, the huge hotel company behind this particular resort, is known for their gentil organisateurs. They call them GOs for short. And basically, these are staff members employed by Club Med at all of their locations everywhere in the world whose sole job is to make sure the guests staying at their hotels have a truly unforgettable experience. 
And so these really friendly GOs are always walking around these hotels and talking to the guests and pointing them to the different places they can go within the hotel. And they encourage the guests to interact with each other and to participate in resort activities. And so a stay at a club med hotel, whether it's Cancun or anywhere in the world, is known to be very upbeat and highly interactive. So Jennifer and her two sons, they get off the shuttle at Club Med Cancun, they go inside, they get checked in, they make their way to their room, they drop their bags, and then they head out to explore the hotel. And pretty much right away, there were geos all over the place coming up to welcome them to the hotel and pointing them to the best restaurants, the best places to go swimming, and what activities were coming up that night and what to look forward to that week. And right away, what stood out to the Buell family, specifically Charlie and Johnny, was the Kids Club slash Teens Club. Basically, the GOs organized really fun games and activities just for the kids, depending on what age they were. And so this was really appealing to Charlie and Johnny to go play with other kids. And it was appealing to Jennifer because this would mean she could go off and actually relax because she would have childcare. So, starting that first night and over the next week they were in Cancun, Jennifer made sure they always were around the resort so that the boys could just take off and go hang out with this kids club teen club whenever they wanted. And so the routine that the Buell family adopted over the course of their vacation was they would get up early, they would go to the white sand beaches right outside of their resort, and then after coming back to the resort, Charlie would almost always cut loose and go hang out for the rest of the day with the kids in the teen club kids club. And Johnny, he mostly stayed with his mom, but over the course of the day, he would leave and do one-off activities with the club. And then at 9.15 p.m. at night, the trio would always link up on the pool deck and they would make their way in to see one of the shows that the Geos were putting on, ranging from comedy sketches to circus tricks. And so all in all, the Buell family vacation to Cancun, Mexico was really going as well as it could have been until a simple game of hide and seek changed everything. On June 18th, so roughly one week after the Buell family had arrived in Mexico, the family got up and they began their typical vacation routine. They headed to the beach and then afterwards, Charlie broke off and went to spend time with the kids at the teen club kids club and Johnny and Jennifer, they mostly stayed together for the rest of the afternoon. That evening, around 8.30 p.m., after all three of the Buells had had dinner, they decided to split up before rejoining at 9.15 to go in and see a show. Johnny wanted to head downstairs and go see a kids-only show. Jennifer wanted to head up to the second level to have chocolate fondue dessert with a friend she had made at the resort. And Charlie wanted to meet up with his friends from the Kids Club Teens Club out on the pool deck where the GOs were organizing a big game of hide and seek. And so after watching his mother walk upstairs to the fondue restaurant and watching his younger brother head downstairs to the kids only show, Charlie turned and ran towards the pool deck. And when he got there, he immediately linked up with his best friend from the vacation, a 13-year-old named Cyrus. And very quickly after that, the GOs who were on the pool deck with all these other kids that were out there, they said, okay, we're going to start counting. You guys all hide. And so the GOs, they walked to the side of this big pool deck. They covered their eyes. They began counting. And all the kids, Charlie and Cyrus included, scattered to find the best hiding spot. And right away, as Charlie and Cyrus are looking for places to hide, they're seeing the other kids are taking up all the best hiding spots. And so for a second, they're panicking. They're not going to have a good spot. Then both of the boys looked over to the side of the pool deck and they realize there is a perfect hiding spot that nobody's taken. Around the outside of this huge open air pool deck was a metal fence. It was only a couple of feet tall and it was made up of metal bars so you could see right through it. It was basically in place just to denote the edges of the resort property. And on one length of this perimeter fence, the south side of this fence, there was a gate built into this fence. And this gate was almost always closed and locked. The only time it was opened was when a GO or another hotel staff member would open it to lead guests out of the resort property to go off and do some excursion. But for some reason, on the night of June 18th, this fence was wide open. On the other side of this fence was just a small rectangular platform that jutted out about 10 feet from the pool deck, same level as the pool deck. And if you were standing on this platform with your back to the pool deck, on your left side would be a very small flight of stairs, just a couple of steps going down. 
And so Charlie and Cyrus, they look over and they see this gate is open and they know there are those stairs kind of tucked down below the platform. And they're thinking if we crouch down on those steps, no one will see us from the pool deck. We'll be obscured from view. And so Charlie and Cyrus, they run over to the open gate, they go through, they walk down a couple of steps and they kind of tuck themselves down so they can barely look up and over onto the pool deck to see if anyone's coming. But they can tell there's no way anyone is going to see them unless they literally walk through the gate and are looking down the steps at them. And so Charlie and Cyrus, they're giggling with excitement because they know they have found the perfect hiding spot. And they're listening as the geos are calling out, okay, ready or not, here we come. And after a couple of minutes, they're hearing the sound of the geos finding all the other kids all over the pool deck. You know, there were some really good hiding spots, but eventually all the kids are found except for Charlie and Cyrus. And so Charlie and Cyrus, they start looking at each other and they're really excited about this, but they know no one's going to find them. But right before Cyrus and Charlie stood up and revealed themselves, Cyrus happened to notice there was a hose, like a garden hose, that was draped down the steps that they were on, and for some reason, the water was turned on. And so Cyrus grabbed the hose, and as he stood up, turning away from Charlie, he began spraying the water onto the pool deck, onto the geos and all the kids who didn't know where they were, and so everybody on the pool deck is suddenly laughing and running away from the water. It's totally chaos. And Cyrus thinks it's hysterical. He's still just spraying everybody down. And then at some point, Cyrus stops and turns to see what Charlie's reaction is to this absolute bedlam that he's created on the pool deck. But when Cyrus turns around, Charlie's not there. Meanwhile, two other hotel guests who had nothing to do with this game of hide and seek, it was a mother and her adult son, they were having a meal up in the second floor restaurant that overlooked the pool deck. And as they're sitting there enjoying their meal, they suddenly hear the sound of boys screaming. Now immediately they both can tell this is not a play scream. Someone is actually in danger, someone is hurt, something's going on here. And they try to look down onto the pool deck where these screams seem to be coming from, but they can't tell. It's dark out there, they can't see what's going on. And so acting on instinct, the woman and her son just stand up and start running through the restaurant and making their way downstairs. And as they're doing this, the woman's husband actually sees her charging through, and he, along with two other boys that happen to be near him, just start running after them, knowing that whatever's going on, it's bad, so they have to go help. And so when these five people get down to the pool deck, they hear the sound of the boys screaming again, and they can tell it's coming from that open gate, that platform area, where Charlie and Cyrus had been hiding. And so these five people charge through the still open gate. They go out onto this platform and they look down the little flight of stairs and they see Cyrus. They don't see anybody else on the platform. It's just this one boy and he looks totally shaken up, totally hysterical. And it's clear he is one of the boys that was screaming. And then before they could even ask him what was going on, they hear a sound coming from somewhere below the steps and they all turn and literally, out of the darkness, Charlie just suddenly emerges and he looks up at the adults and just says in a very calm voice, Save me! Save me! This normally completely off-limits, fenced-off platform that jutted out past the pool deck where the boys were hiding, that was actually a dock that sat over a swampy lagoon. And underneath that dock was a nest of crocodiles. And when Cyrus and Charlie were on that lower step, the crocodiles had noticed them, and when Cyrus had stood up and begun spraying the water onto the pool deck, one of those crocodiles, a 13-foot monster, had come out of the water, turned around, and literally leapt up onto those steps, bit Charlie by the leg, and pulled him into the water. The screams that woman and her son had heard while they were in that restaurant were Cyrus's and Charlie's, because initially when Charlie was pulled into the water, he didn't go directly under. And so Cyrus had managed to grab onto Charlie's arms and he was trying to pull Charlie out of the crocodile's mouth and the two of them were screaming for help. But by the time that woman and the other four people got down to the platform, Cyrus lost his grip on Charlie and the croc and Charlie went under the water. And so those five people were standing there when the crocodile and Charlie just came back out of the water. And that's when Charlie was saying, save me, save me. He was in the crocodile's mouth. And when these five people saw Charlie and understood what was going on, without any hesitation, the adults leapt into the dark lagoon waters that are clearly infested with crocodiles and began beating the crap out of this crocodile. 
And while this melee is happening in these dark, murky lagoon waters with crocodiles everywhere, someone had gone into the fondue bar and told Jennifer, your son's being attacked by a crocodile. And she instantly leapt up and just ran across the restaurant, knocking anything over that was in her way. And finally, she got downstairs to the pool deck. She went through that gate, out to that platform, and she saw her boy. Charlie was laying on his back, surrounded by totally frantic and hysterical adults. Charlie's leg looked like it had been through a meat grinder. But Charlie was awake, and he was talking to the adults near him. In the time it took Jennifer to run through the restaurant and get down to the pool deck, those adults who had leapt into the murky lagoon water to fight with this crocodile had literally beaten it so badly that it released Charlie. And according to the people who watched this happen, this crocodile was putting up an unbelievable fight. It was whipping its head side to side, tearing into Charlie's leg. It kept pulling Charlie deeper and deeper into the water. And these adults just didn't stop. They were yanking on this crocodile, punching its eyes, gouging its eyes. And finally, it worked. When Charlie was finally pulled to safety and was laying on the dock, he was in rough shape and no one knew if he was going to survive or not. But luckily, there just happened to be a trauma nurse who was staying at the resort who came outside, she assessed the situation, and she took charge, she stopped the bleeding in his leg, and she stayed with him and kept him calm until paramedics finally arrived. Charlie would be rushed to the hospital where he would immediately undergo several surgeries that would save his life. Also, surgeons were able to miraculously save his leg. Initially, it seemed like he might have to have it amputated. As for Club Med, their response to this incident was enormous. Not only did they pay for all of Charlie's medical bills, but they also invested a lot of money into securing not only that fence and gate that led to the dock where he was attacked, but also just generally speaking around the resort to make sure there were no more attacks. Today, Charlie is back in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania with his family. And considering the horrible trauma he went through, he's remarkably well adjusted. In fact, in the Halloween that followed this attack, Charlie dressed up as a crocodile. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, the next time you're working at the county fair selling ice cream and the Amazon music follow button comes up to you to buy a vanilla cone, sell them one, but instead of using vanilla ice cream, use vanilla mayonnaise. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that honors and supports victims of violent crime as well as their families. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. If you want to check out our merch, join our Discord server, or just see what's going on at Ballin Studios, head on over to our brand new website, ballinstudios.com. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time.